Okay. Ah,、uh, yeah. My guest today is Joe Carano, and we're going to talk about an operation. I don't know if many are who study history are aware of, or not, who don't study history are aware of, because the operation is called Operation Valkyrie, an inside plot about assassinating Adolf Hitler. And I gotta ask, what what is it about? Because there've been two attempts to assassinate Hitler before, but they both fail. And what is it about this? This attempt that is so makes it stand out in front of the other two. Well, I think that the reason this one stands out is certainly Hollywood, right? The movies.、Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's also a need for the German people to find a hero out of all of the horror in World War II.、Um, so, so you have this, you know, this man that you know it's kind of been romanticized about. And he, you know, he risked his life, and he goes into the Wolfschanzer, the Wolf Lair in、uh, Eastern Prussia, now today Poland. And you know, he plants a bomb, and it blows up, and he thinks he kills Hitler. And so I think, I think, really, he stands spoiler out. Spoiler alert! Most, yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> But he's he's definitely, you know, I think, especially when we talked about the Brian Singer movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. It was very popular. A lot of Germ, some Germans didn't like it. Some did. You know, a lot of Americans liked it. You know, it was a popular movie, and it, and it was, I think, a pretty decent movie. But we also have to look at, you know, Hollywood and its own kind of, with their apparatus, is a, you know, spits out a story that is not necessarily a hundred percent true. You know, I mean, and I want to ask. Everything- How accurate is the movie? Not what you said. I, I I would think you know after I've studied Valkyrie for a, a long time, and I would say that you know it starts out in roughly 1943, and you know him getting wounded in North Africa, fighting with、uh, the Africa Corps,、um, and then moving into、uh, his、uh, role as I believe it was adjutant to、uh, General Fromm. Uh, with the the home army,、um, and then the actual plot, I think it does a really good job. I mean, you know, again, it's it's it's, you know, and then the actual executions, you know, they're you. I think in the movie they're actually using the Bendler block, the 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 area where the、uh, where the military intelligence and the World War II naval building where he actually got executed. That I think they actually used that. Um, actual area in Berlin, but I would say I mean I like it. I like the movie. I just、uh, you know like、uh, we have discussed, it's it's more or less the backstory of what was going on that maybe is the kind of the confusing or the charcoal gray area of history. So who was close from the Stauffenberg? Who? What kind of person was he? Well, he well. First of all, he's an aristocrat. He's he's a monarch.、Um, he is a he. You know, he's a man with,、um, you know, he's you know following the outbreak of of the war. He's aristocrat. He's、uh, comes from a military family.、Um, he believes in the. The notion of、uh, the Third Reich in the beginning,、uh, he participates in the. He, you know, he's a decorated. He's a brave man. You know, he participates in、uh, what they call Fall Gelb, the invasion of the Low Countries in France. He's,、uh, but before that, he's Fall Vice, which is the invasion of Poland, and then he participates in the invasion、uh, Operation Barbarossa. I mean, he's a family man. He's a You know, decent human being that has his ideology based in the old aristocratic or monarchist、uh, Germans. So he's not. He's not. I don't believe he's a member of the Nazi Party. I'm not too sure by the end of the 30s if regular army here or the Wehrmacht could join the Nazi Party, because in the early 30s there was、uh, declarations that. You cannot mix politics and military, so a lot of these guys aren't Nazi Party members. The Nazi Party members are part of the, like the Algemeine SS or the Waffen SS. You know the different 
uh, generals that are part of that paramilitary organization, those are party members. And those are kind of the more fanatics that history tells us they're kind of more of the fanatics. But um, Stauffenberg, he's, like I said, he's an idealist. He believes in a strong Germany. He believes in, um, uh, you know, that the Versailles Treaty was unfair to the Germans. He wants to retake the air, the, the lands lost from the Versailles treaties, parts of Prussia, like Danzig, um, east, you know, eastern, uh, western Poland. So he's, he's a man that's, uh, you know, he's not quite, he goes to, I think, Lieutenant Colonel. He's, he's not, not he's not Nazified, he's just supporting the, the idea. Kind of. He is. He is, but I think one thing, you know, maybe if we could just talk for a minute about um, national socialism. Of course. I think, um, I think because when we, we got to break down these characters into, you know, the belief system of the day. And most of the conspirators were enthusiastic supporters of the Nazis. I don't know how much more I can stress that. And really the goal of national socialism is to consciously organize society, right? In accordance with the natural order, Darwinism. You know, um, it's, it's the applications of the laws of nature to human affairs. So, so, you, so it's a dominant thought system. It's kind of like, you know, a comparison would be uh, multiracialism, right? You're looking for racial equality or Marxism with economics. Democracy is the equality of politics. And then Christianity, you have the spiritual equality. So you look at this, and, and Adolf Hitler is a keen observer of living nature. And he comes up with, you know, you know, he's not the only person that is developing this, this, this ideology of national socialism, but he's but he sees the general equality of people. And he sees that as a um, an order of society, the structure and hierarchy of society. And so that's where he comes up with, with the Aryan master race, right? They call mm -hmm. it the Heron folk. And so you have this, um, this ideology, ideology of national socialism that people like, that I believe from studying history, people like Stauffenberg believed in. He believes in these um, the ideology of the order of nature. They do, Germans overwhelmingly at this time, believe that the Slavs, where, you know, the Slavic people towards the east are the Untermenschen, the subhumans that they want to conquer. It's kind of like, you know, it dovetails into the Holocaust with the Jews. So, so I guess when we're looking at these characters, you kind of got to look at the the you know social or the natural order of how socialism views things, and so I think Stauffenberg was along that line of thinking. You know, he's uh, especially especially in the 1930s. Um, you know, he he might like I said is a member of a Nazi party, but he does believe in the ideology that is presented by the Nazis because they're monarchists. And the, they're conservative monarchists, so they're 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 just as hateful towards the Weimar Republic post World War One, like the Nazis. They're the same. They believe that the Nazis and the and, and these monarchists they have kind of the same goals. So with the rise of Hitler and the recovery from the Great Depression in the 30s, or this beginning of the Great Depression of it. In, within the late 30s, they believe that that Hitler is actually, you know, showing them the way um, to, you know, more uh, dominance and more success economically and socially within the world. So, who are some other key characters that we should look at before going going into the operation itself? Um, well, you have, uh, you know, um, you have you have probably several thousand conspirators, right? Some of the, uh, let's talk about some of the main, to keep it yeah, brief, main, some of the, the main, main characters. The main ones, so so the main ones are like General Albrecht. He's in the army general office, which is the epicenter 
of the July 20th plot. And he's, he's putting together the resistant movement. And, and he's a, uh, he's a, Albrecht is, is um, a part of the elite of Germany. Um, he's a highly decorated soldier. He earned the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross during the invasion of Poland. Um, but he, he, but prior to that, he becomes disillusioned with the Nazis after the um, Night of the Long Knives, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they, it's called, I think in German, my German's terrible, but I, thought, I think it's called Nacht und Langen Messer or Operation Hummingbird is another word. And this is when in 1934, um, uh, Hitler goes around to consolidate the power within the Nazi party. He wants to centralize everything. And he goes around and he sees a threat from the, the SA, the Sturmabteilung, the Ernst Ruhm. He sees him as possibly planning a, 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 a coup against Hitler. And so in the Night of the Long Knives, they go around and they arrest hundreds and they execute probably almost a 500, 1,000, somewhere along those lines. But Albrecht sees this and he starts thinking when the night of the long nights, he starts thinking that maybe this isn't a part of a system he wants to be in. However, he still does not, uh, he still remains in the military and he still participates in, because light of the night of the long knives in, the night of the long knives is in 1934. And then you have the invasion of Poland, fall vice in 1939. And Albrecht is part of that. And he even, like I said, gets the nice cross of the Iron Cross. So he still believes in these, um, the expansionism, right? Lebensraum, right? Have you heard right. that term? Um, so there's, and then, then you have um, the chief of the Army High Command, Ludwig Beck, Beck. and he's, he's, a, he's chief of the uh, staff from, roughly 1935 to maybe the very beginning of 1939. And, and he's, he's one of the people that uh, is part of the conspiracy that it's going to negotiate with the allies after the decapitation of the Third Reich. Okay, he's going to go negotiate peace with France and Britain. But he is another interesting char character too, because he wants to keep a lot of the holdings, the conquered holdings, including the Czech Republic, well, now it's the Czech Republic, Austria, he wants to keep Western Poland. So he, he, he wants to negotiate from a position of strength, but I think Beck is a bit delusional in everything that's going on because I don't think the allies are gonna negotiate with the conspirators. It's too late in the game, you know, it's July, 20th, 1944, we've, the Allies have already landed in uh, Normandy. Uh, they're, they're already in Italy, uh, France. They've taken over North Africa. They're, they're just about to liberate France and the lowland countries. So there's not really this, they don't have a position of strength to negotiate. The unconditional surrender is gonna happen, but Beck thinks that he can still negotiate peace. And then you have, you have several, uh, field marshals involved. Three, three of them. They end up getting. You have, uh, you have uh, Weizleben. Um, he's a, a general uh, who becomes a field marshal after the invasion of France. He's another highly decorated army soldier. Um, you know, he wants to also uh, kind of along the lines of Beck. He wants to negotiate with the Allies to kind of save face and keep Germany from becoming uh, an occupied country. He wants to keep them from another Versailles Treaty. Because this is another, this is where kind of the delusion is, is they think that they're gonna, there's another Ver Versailles Treaty on the horizon, which astonishing, it doesn't happen, you know. But so you have, and then you have like, he's not a main conspirator, but you have Field Marshal, Rommel who ends up killing himself. He's kind of on the fringes of it. He knows about it. I think um, uh, there's another one. I'm, 
I think it's Cluj. I'd have to look, but he's another one that's on the fringes of it and ends up killing himself. But they're, they're, these guys are all decorated field marshals that they're kind of on the fringes of the conspiracy. But as soon as the, uh, as soon as Hitler's killed, they're going to pounce, you know, they're going to get on it and they're going to try to save Germany. And then you have uh, General uh, von Treskow and he's, He's, he's another interesting character. I think he's the most ideologically and moral of all of them, yet he has some, some pretty dark background when it comes to his service in the Ost Front, the East Front, you know, within Ukraine, Poland, Russia. And, and, and Treskow, he's a career army officer like, like, uh, like uh, Betts Levin and, and Beck. And he's, um, he studies law, he's, he's, but he's part of the Spartacus movement after World War I. He's a World War I veteran. Uh, and he's, he, uh, actually, he, he, he's not part of the Spartacus movement. He, he suppresses the Spartacus movement. The Spartacus movement in January 1919 there, the communists, you know, what you really have after World War I in Germany is kind of a civil war where you got the Spartacus movement, the Reds, and then you got the, the Reichswehr, and then, you know, they're battling out for control of Germany. This, this has a, you know, it's another great- Now you got the Weimar war. Republic in the middle. Yeah, things. the Weimar Republic is just getting started, you know, and and so he so it's just getting started and you have all these influences kind of trying for a power grab, you know, it's a, it's a very um, unfortunate um, situation. But Tresco, he's he's, you know, he after 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 he, you know, he's with the Reichswehr army in, in 1920, he resigns and he travels through Brazil and goes to Britain, he comes to the United States. And then he's, he's another Prussian um, officer. He gets married and, you know, he kind of falls into uh, army life. He comes back to it in, you know, in the thirties. Um, you know, he's, he gets his staff training in, I think 1934, 35 uh, at the General Staff War Academy. Um, he's the best in his class. He's a real promising officer. But ideologically, he sees the rise of Nazism, especially the Nuremberg Laws. And what were they in 1934? He sees the Nuremberg Laws that strip Jews of their citizenship as very disturbing. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, it's very, it's, it weighs on his mind. And so he is one that he's starting to plot in the 30s even about trying to remove Hitler. But he's, he also serves under one of the, some of the most brilliant minds in the, uh, you know, generals, Field Marshal Eric von Manstein. He serves under Werner von Frisch. He he's, has close connection with Ludwig Beck. And so he, he is very liked, he's a very capable military officer, but the, the complexity comes where he's also involved in, you know, the invasion of uh, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia. He take, he's, he's, in, he's part of the general staff of Army Group A under Gerd von Rundstedt and Eric von Manstein. Um, and that was actually in the, the invasion of France. He, he's in, he, he's in the, he gets to participate in the brilliant sickle cut Van Manstein uh, formulates to destroy uh, the British and French forces and capture France. So he's part of the Manstein plan when it comes to the invasion of, of France. But then he's, then he goes into, uh, uh, he's with von Kluge and Fader von Bach and a couple other field marshals with Operation Barbarossa, and that that's actually our Army Group Center, and so he's he's participating in in um, you know all of these operations. He's conflicted. He he sees a powerful Germany. He believes in Lebensraum. He believes that um, uh, Germany needs its living space. 
but he's not quite um, a a complete supporter of the Third Reich. I would think von Stauffenberg was more of a somebody that was really on board with the whole you know rise of the Third Reich, but. But um, Treskow is in the wings. But Treskow, what's important about him is he, him and General Albrecht are the primary architects of the July 20th, 1944 plot. So those are the two, like, you want to talk about the two main characters, those are it. Stauffenberg is a main character, but these two men are the architects. Yeah. I guess I, I want to go back and the Stauffenberg come back from Africa, right? What happens then with him? How does Africa change Stauffenberg? Okay, so this is this is where the you know the charcoal gray area of history. Stauffenberg is very much in support of everything, but he goes into uh, it's around the the tail end of the fall. Uh, in about November, December 1942, he goes into um, the uh, French North Africa, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe he's with the, which is VC France, with the 10th Panzer Division. And so there he's promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and um, he's an officer in the general staff. And what happens, um, he's he's there he's he's at Kasserine Pass um he's um they destroyed the Americans at Kasserine Pass um they have some success there but in but it starts falling apart and by but on April of 1943 um he's directing vehicle movements or something like that and a P-40 Warhawk uh, an American aircraft um which was, I think, flown by the Australian Air Force, uh, bombs and strafes his unit. Uh, and what happens is he loses his right hand, he loses his left eye. And he Doesn't he lose several... part of his left fingers as well? Yeah, he loses several, I think he loses two fingers, two or three fingers, on his left hand. I might have it confused, but he loses his right, he loses several, and he loses one of his eyes. I believe that it's his left, um, how he wore his patch. So he's he spends several months in the hospital, and I think this is what changes his attitude. I think he knows now, you know, uh, he knows for certain now Germany's gonna lose the war. They just lost Stalingrad, the uh, there's the invasion of Italy um, and this is 1943 and he knows they're going to lose the war so this is when he joins the resistance okay and how does so it get, is, how does he get in touch with the resistance how does he meet them he was always during his um, he he earns the um, wound badge and gold and you know that's that's pretty high up you got to lose an arm or a leg or anything like that and um while he's in the hospital um he, through his connections he learns of some of the plotters um he gets introduced to them i don't exactly recall who introduced him to the plotters but i think stauffenberg by 1943 when he was getting wounded, he's already disenfranchised or he's he's not becoming um, as hardline supporter of the Third Reich as he's been. So I'm that that's an area I'm not too sure how he gets in touch with them. Um, you know, he, he's a guy, he has a lot of connections, you know, he served under uh, many generals, a lot of generals are delusion, disillusioned with Hitler because he's, he's, uh, you know, he's taking over operations, he's doing the military strategy. So somewhere in there, he gets connected. I wouldn't doubt that he already knew uh, Treskow and Albrecht and possibly Beck prior to him going to Africa. So he probably knows what's going on. 
So, what? How does it feel? Is being treated by the Reich after his he gets to become disability disability if you call it that. Uh, does he feel like he has no future? Does he feel like he had no future with the Reich after he was he lost his I, arm and he had I, I think so. I mean, like with other combat wounded or people experience combat, he's got severe PTSD, right? Mm. You know, um, post traumatic stress. Um, he's um, he's also seeing that another yeah. I think he, I don't know how much that affects him. I think it's not necessarily he sees his military career in jeopardy because they certainly kept him in the military. Mm-hmm. They certainly thought of him as a hero. And he, he earns the German cross in gold on May 8th of, of that year. So he, I mean, he's, he's looked at as a hero. So his career, I don't think is in jeopardy. I think he has PTSD, and I think he's seeing that Germany is being bombed by the Allies. He sees them losing the war. He's he's hearing the losses from other military officers in the East, and and, and now he knows from his contacts that the Allies are going to invade somewhere in France or Belgium. So he's looking now, I think he's late in the game, and he's looking at it as this is self-preservation for him and his family. I think it's, I don't, and for Germany, I think it's becomes more of a selfish reasons rather than ideological now. You know, we get into that, like we talked before about the Hollywood. I think, I think he, he, they certainly weren't doing it because they were exterminating Jews. Even though they knew about that, well, we can talk about some of the controversy, but that certainly isn't playing into here because why would you wait to 1944? The extermination of the Jews and the Slavs in the East between, between 1939 and 1944, you've already got tens of millions of people dead. So that to me tells me that it's a little late in the game to get rid of Hitler in 1944 you're 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 for sure gonna lose by july 20th 1944 when the when the plot is enacted it is certainly certainly the generals knew that the germans were going to lose the war it was how much they were going to lose it by and as you can see it's it's catastrophic for the germans they lose more people soldiers in 1944 to 1945 than they've let than they've lost the previous three or four years so the devastation is going to get much worse but they've already had so much um so much destruction it just seems like yeah 1944 i mean by july 20th 1944 Auschwitz, I think, is liberated in January of 1945. So these concentration camps in the, in the next nine months are actually, even though there's a lot of people getting murdered, and I'm not trying to downplay that, but you're getting, but it's slowing down, right? Mm-hmm. The, the mass murders are slowing down because the Germans are being forced back, the railroad hubs all around Poland, all the extermination camps are being bombed. So you have a lot of this kind of toning down. And, and so again, 1944, I just don't see it being ideologically about the Holocaust. I don't, I don't come, I don't look at the July 20th plot and the Holocaust as anything to do with each other. This is about self-preservation. Um, but there is, uh, there's just two more guys I want to briefly mention of course. here. Uh, there's Dr. Carl Gordler. He's the mayor of Leipzig and and I'll talk about him, his controversy in the back, but he's, he's going to be chancellor of the new government. And during, so he's the mayor of Leipzig, he's a central figure, and he's going to become chancellor uh, once Hensler is, the, you know, the coup is, is successful. But he is somebody that's interesting enough is once he's arrested, he gives up tons of conspirators. He, he, he tells the Gestapo dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of names, and maybe thousands. He causes so many deaths, arrests, and executions, it's, uh, 
it's unbelievable. So I mean, so he's an interesting character. And then you have General Fromm, who's he's the commander of the Ertzots here. The Ertzots here is the replacement army in Berlin, and it's when and it's supposed to deal with civil unrest and to be used. And that's that's Valkyrie right there. Uh, we kind of the the, the Operation Valkyrie or the movie and things like that, that gets told to us as that's the operation. But Valkyrie is really the contingency plan to control the homeland civil unrest. And that is what's that home army, that replacement army, army that General Fromm commands is what is supposed to take control of the government at the July 20th plot. So that's why kind of Fromm is important. He, he's uh, he's on the fringes of the conspiracy, but as soon as it fails, he knows it fails, and he's the one that has a lot of these guys executed. But so that's kind of uh, it's the contingency plan for for the home army to deal with civil unrest, and that's kind of the that's the center of the military coup, right? That's the that's the that's the other epicenter. That's what's going to arrest the Goebbels and arrest you know, all the, the SS and so on and so forth and take control of the government. So, so yeah, how, the, how did they get together and plan the plot? Like, how did they find out that is it difficult for them to get a long time, just those the conspirators or did it, is it, is well, it a problem for them? Well, it's certainly a problem. Um, I mean, Hitler is, I mean, Hitler's, you know, he's like the cat with nine lives, right? Mm. I mean, he, he, I mean, not like getting together to plan the, the operation. Oh, um, well, they, you know, there's different areas within Berlin, within the Eastern Front, between Treskow and other conspirators. There's all sorts of places they meet to develop the plan. Um, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, you know, I mean, you know, people's homes, they have secret locations. I mean, it, it's, it's all, it's all, you know, doable. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of taking something that's written on paper and implementing it, you know, in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want, we could also talk a little bit about, you know, just before we get into the, the heart of the actual, op the day of yeah, Valkyrie. We could talk about some of the plots against Hitler. Yeah, of course. Because there's probably 15 of them that we know about. But you know, in in 1932, um, Hitler gets sick at a dinner in Berlin, and a lot of his other, a lot of his other, you know, Nazi comrades are also get sick, and they think he was poisoned. I think. It probably wasn't poison, might be food poisoning. Hitler is one that doesn't get as sick, sick as the other members, but that can could be contributed to as being a vegetarian. Um, so that is kind of one that I'm not too sure about. Some people say someone tried to poison. Um, a, it's that same year, a letter was mailed by Ludwig Osner from France uh, with uh, poison in it, but uh, one of his colleagues uh, turned, turned, said a letter is coming. Uh, the security apparatus caught the letter and nothing happened to Hitler. Um, uh, we talked about the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. Um, a lot of members of the Fry Corps and the SA, um, they become disillusioned with Hitler and a guy named Beppo Romer uh, tried to uh, uh, assassinate Hitler, but it was, he was caught. Um, Beppo, interesting enough, is he ends up becoming a member of the Communist Party after being a fascist. Um, so he's disillusioned. Uh, between 1934 and 1938, uh, there's probably another half dozen that were unsuccessful. What about the bombing of the beer hall? Uh, the beer, the, Ber the Burger Brawl killer? Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. That comes in. You have uh, well after right before the Burger Brawl Keller, you had the Victory Parade in Warsaw, where the German army put explosives in the road, but Hitler took a different route. Mm. It failed. But that same year, um, yeah, in the Burger Brawl Keller in 
Munich, which um, if you ever go to Munich, it's kind of an interesting place. Um, there was a bomb that was placed in the Burger Brau Keller because remember, this is where a lot of the 1923 pooch and all that happened. Um, you know, a lot of the planning and stuff, a lot of the planning of national socialism. So, it, so it's a uh, kind of a, a mecca, so to speak, for, for the Nazis. But a bomb was placed there. Hitler leaves early. It explodes. It kills, I don't know, six to ten people, what I remember. Um, nothing, I don't even, I don't know whatever came of that, um, if they ever figured out. Um, who that was supposed to be. Um, uh, you know, there's not too many between 39 and 43. Hip Hitler's pretty sharp. He knows people don't like him. So, you know, he's got good security. He makes less and less and less public appearances. Um, he's in, uh, let's see, he's in um, the Ukraine and uh, he's supposed to go to the Ukraine in 1943. And uh, several army generals were going to surround him with tanks and arrest him. Uh, he never showed up. So <laughs> that's another, another thing. I mean, he never, and, and some of these that you read about you, I'm not too sure if I totally believe these conspiracies. I believe there's a lot of people doing it, but I think they're also might've been told after the fact when Germany lost the war. Um, but in but the uh, I think the one that probably interests you a lot that we talked about was when he was in Smolensk, Russia, in 1943, and now we're getting into kind of Operation Valkyrie, right? Yeah. So he's in. Um, <clears throat> one second here. So he's in um, Smolensk, Russia, and. He's inspecting the troops of Army Group Center and von Treskow's there and uh, Schlebendorf, uh, who is the lia liaison between Treskow and Berlin and major, um, a guy named Boselager, if I said his name right. And their plan was to, once Hitler got there, they were going to surround him and they were going to shoot him. There was also a, a conspiracy uh, they were going to do this in the woods, right? Surround mm -hmm. him, execute him. That didn't play out because he started. Oh, what, didn't they, what didn't play out? So I still want it. Uh, um, the, well, when he gets to Smolensk, Russia, this is leading up to the bottle and the fuse that you see in the movie, the, the bomb in the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, they, when he's in Smolensk, Russia, he, they're, they're Treskow and Schlebrendorf and Boselager and several other generals and conspirators put together what was called Operation Spark. And this was supposed to spark a coup. And what happens is once Hitler gets there and he's walking in the forest, they are going to surround him and shoot him. Hmm. That never happens. I think because there's too many SS guarding him, and this plays into the conspiracy that is frustrating. None of these men yet were willing to sacrifice their lives. Mm -hmm. They weren't willing to pull the pistol and shoot them at dinner. A lot of times they disarm these guys. But the conspirators would only go so far. So, so, um, so he, he's, there, he's heavily guarded, but also Field Marshal von Kluge, who's one of the guys on the very, very outer fringes of the July 20th plot. He steps in and says, don't do it. But if you do it, you know what? I'm not going to do anything about it. But he encourages these guys not to, to abandon their plan. And then they try when Hitler's going to have lunch that day, they're going to shoot him again. It didn't, you know, and so they have, they have a field marshal telling them not to do it. And then they abandon their plans. And so the last minute, the, the, the movie doesn't show this, but the last minute um, when, the, um, when all these plans were abandoned, Schlebendorf, <clears throat> he decides he's going to put a, he's going to put some plastic explosive with a fuse in a spirit bottle and put it in the baggage hold of Hitler's plane. So, and that's what you, that's what you see in the brain. Oh, I'm sorry. 
No, 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 go on. Yeah. That's what you see in the Brian, Brian Singer movie. It, you see, um, you see Treskow actually doing it, mm. but that's not, he hands it to one of the, the adjutants that gets on with Hitler and it was supposed to explode. It's not Treskow at all. It's Schlebendorf. He's the one that puts the, the explosives in the baggage hold. But if I recall correctly, Schreiber in his, in his book, Rise and Fall of Third Reich, mentioned this as well. This, uh, the, bomb, the bomb with the fuse that does not go off. Yeah, it doesn't go off because the fuses that the Germans are using, they're not good. They're not good quality as the British or the American fuses. And so I believe, and I, I'm not absolute, I think for the July 20th plot, they actually don't use a German fuse. I think it's British or some other country. It's from the, so they take the fuse, they put it in, Hitler goes up in the plane, but at high altitude, right, you're in freezing temperatures and the bomb doesn't go off. So they, they're they waiting, and I think, I'm sure that the movie was somewhat true. I'm sure these guys were waiting in the office by the phone, trying to, you know, get the phone call, Hitler's dead. And they're waiting and waiting and waiting. Next thing you know, boom, he lands. The So uh, Schlavendor rushes to Berlin, he gets the bottle and he brings it back. It shows Treskow in the movie, but uh, who's Kenneth Brana, but it's not actually him. So they're almost, uh, they're not- What is their reaction when they see that Hitler lands and he's just no perfect defiant, nothing, no explosion, they, nothing. Well, Hitler believes it's divine providence, right? He, he believes almost like, you know, an old king would say he was the, you know, ordained by God. No, but you know, what is the brother's reaction? What are the, what is the, their reaction when they see Hitler still is still alive? It, it, it's just you know, it's disappointment. It's like what? How? You know, we can't kill this guy. But you have so they're disappointed, they're upset, but you have to look at their actions. Nobody is willing to actually risk their life, like. Bring the day, you know, the bottle in the plane with you. You know, nobody's willing to do that. Nobody's willing to sacrifice their life to kill Hitler. Do you see what I mean? I mean, to be fair, would you have? I mean, I, I don't think it's a good question. I mean, you know, we all have, you know, we're all human beings. I mean, I can't blame them. Um, I guess if I was... I'm not that way. I mean, you know, in the conditions where I live, I mean, if I was in the conditions of possibly, you know, a Russian or something like that, in the way the Germans were, you know, slaughtering us, maybe I would have risked my life then. But no, I, I, I just, I guess I, I probably wouldn't have done it either, you know. Yeah, but, same. You know, you know, I mean, but but looking at it as a historian and it's, they're so invested in these plots. Mm. They hate, hate Hitler and his regime so much. I just, they, none of them are willing to do it. However, however, in 1943, uh, a guy named Axel Streitport, he comes up and he says, I'll do it. I'll blow myself up. Mm. <laughs> so you, so you have a guy, he said he's going to go into the wolf layer and first of all for those who may not be familiar what, what was the wolf's lair just a brief uh, uh, explanation here oh sure the wolf's lair okay so you, it's now in let me get situated here in north eastern poland it used to be part of prussia but the wolf's wolf shanzer or wolf slayer was his was adolf hitler's forward operating headquarters. It's where uh, people like <clears throat> Alfred Yodel, uh, one of his, uh, one of the guys actually in the room when the bomb exploded, uh, Alfred Yodel and, and a lot of his other high ranking army generals would do all the planning for the, the further invasion of Russia. That was their main headquarters. So Hitler flew there all the time. He spent a lot of time there. I think he also had one called Werewolf. And I think that's somewhere in Ukraine or that area. So, but he didn't go there much, but it was the Wolf Slayer and the Berghof. 
the Berghof is, you know, his mountain retreat uh, in Berchtesgaden in southern uh, Bavaria, where he spends a lot of time. You know, you see a lot of the Ava Brown. You ever been on YouTube and see her filming everybody? That's that's the that's the uh, that's his uh, retreat in um, in uh, Bavaria in the mountains there. And then the Wolf Slayer or the Wolf Slayers in, in Prussia, which is now Poland. And it's a series of concrete bunkers that it has a completely like, uh, it has inner, outer, way outer security. And, and Hitler would go there and plan and get updates from his generals. He spent quite a bit of time there. So, so I think in the I think in the movie it was Stauffenberg who met Hitler in the in his home. How the, how does it get to meet meet him and sign Operation Valkyrie as it was well, it was kind of his idea right to submit Operation Valkyrie a thing. Sure, but, I think there's three uh, key players in that. Um, uh, you have uh, von Stauffenberg who is uh, you know working for General Fromm. And General Fromm is the guy that will, you know, who will uh, command the, the home army that will take care of any civil unrest. And that's Operation Valkyrie is to implement that. And so, so the changes were, and so you have Stauffenberg as his adjutant works for him. But he needs I, Hitler's signature, right? He needs to have his approval personally. Oh, yeah, yeah. They go and, and supposedly they have it signed. Uh, Hitler doesn't read it. And they, you know, have the revisions done so they can actually, uh, you know, kind of tweak how the, the implementation of Valkyrie will happen. And that is signed at the, the, the uh, Hitler retreat in, um, in Berchtesgaden. Now, according to some sources, they say that he is disgusted by the team that Hitler is with, the Nazi inner circle. Is that, do you think that is true, that he was disgusted by this inner circle of, of Hitler personally? Um, could, could you repeat that, please? So in, in several sources, in sources, they say that he was uh, disgusted by Hitler when he, when he met him personally. And that he and, and, and of the inner circle. Do you think there's a truth to that? To that? Well, I think so. Um, I think though. Um, I think he's disgusted with them by 1943. I don't think he's. We're talking about Stauffenberg, right? Yeah. I don't think he's disgusted with him when with, with the successes in Russia, in France, in Norway, in Denmark, the Lowland countries. He, he's not disgusted then. He's disgusted now because they're losing. And then he sees Hitler making a series of mistakes. And one of the series of mistakes that really discuss uh, von Stauffenberg is Hitler's lackadaisical response of a invasion of the Allies in France. He, but you have to understand, Hitler compartmentalizes every single person: Goering, Goebbels, Keitel. He 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 just gives so much information, so much information. But in turn, these guys all want to please him so much. People like Goering are assuring Hitler that an invasion in, in Normandy or the Calais area, right, is not going to happen because they'll, they'll repulse him and slaughter him on the beaches. So he has his, all his generals telling Hitler what he wants to hear. So von Stauffenberg knows this. And he knows that Hitler is making these mistakes and just being lackadaisical about his response. And that just infuriates von Stauffenberg. But it infuriates him only when they're losing. You see what I mean? That's where I think the history is really gray, is that everybody likes a winner, right? Until something goes wrong. And then that person get blamed. Well, it's this all starts to happen around was Stalingrad when you know the what was it the Sixth Army um, uh, is uh, is surrounded in Stalingrad and destroyed by the Soviets. Um, yeah, Field Marshal von Paulus is the the leader and he's told to resist until the last man and he ends up surrendering. But they could have escaped 
Stalingrad was an absolute complete Hitler bungle of the war because he took resources to destroy Stalingrad simply because it was the name of Joseph Stalin. And so he's, he's starting to move the chess pieces on the board in the wrong way. And so Stauffenberg knows this, generals know it, the SS knows it, but people are still fanatically loyal to him. So I think, I think, I think it's not until 1943 and then when von Stauffenberg gets wounded with the Africa Corps in North Africa that then he becomes disgusted. So how how do they get close into the wound slayer and how do they get hit get their access to the to the wound slayer? Well Stauffenberg, here's where Stauffenberg is the key. Somebody like Witzliebel or Ludwig Beck or Girdler or Treskow, they're not going to be able to get access. But Stauffenberg is the he is the chief of staff or the adjutant for the home army. So he, he's able to go and give updates to Hitler, right? So he has access to Hitler. And this is why he's the key player in bringing the bomb. So um, this is, um, so he goes into, so, I mean, we're getting into the July 20th plot um, where, you know, they go to the wolf, wolf Slayer near, it's in near what's, at the time was called Rastenburg, East, East Prussia. Um, and, but several days before that, it's almost called off because they think that the conspiracy has been uh, discovered by the Gestapo. Right. But on the, on the morning, um, but on the morning of July 20th, Stauffenberg takes a plane to the Wolfschanze uh, to, to join uh, Hitler's military conference. So he, this is his access. He's the chief of staff for the home army. He goes there. He's gonna, he's. This is where everybody's updating him about what's going on in Russia and all that. So so he he goes in there and he he arrives. He easily enters. He enters. He has an adjutant. It's a lieutenant. I can't remember his name, but he enters. Uh, von von Hef, Heflin. Von Heflin, I think, is his aide. And they, they easily get through security and uh, they show up and um, supposedly Stauffenberg uses his diff's ability to change his shirt. And in the movie, you know, they show he's got blood on his shirt, mm. but that's not what it is. It's, he's, it's stifling hot in July. And I don't know if you've ever been to Poland or, or you know, Prussia area or that area, but it gets really hot in July. And so he's dripping wet. And so he asked to go into, I believe it's Wilhelm Keitel's, Field Marshal Keitel's office, who is the head of the um, Oberkommando West, I believe. I think that's what it is. But he, he goes into his office and he changes his shirt. And during this time, you know, he's soaking wet. And von uh, Haufden, Hefton, I can't pronounce his name in German, used the pliers you know, he crushes the, you know, they insert the, the explosive. It's like a pencil going into a detonator of about uh, mm. two pounds, a kilogram and a half. They put it in, in there. And what they do is they take the pliers. They show it in the movie that Stauffenberg has special pliers, but that doesn't make any sense. It makes sense that his aide de camp, Hafton, would actually be doing the one to break the uh, capsule. So... They break the capsule, which is, you know, it's got this, uh, uh, I think it's called cupric chloride. And it's, and it gives you about, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And it starts burning through. They put it in a briefcase, okay? They put it in a briefcase and then the meeting's going on. Now here's one of the keys. The original meeting was to be held in the concrete bunker, right? Yeah. And, it, and this is where if you set off an explosion, like if you're in a concrete bunker with because, you know, an explosion explodes out. Right. Mm. And what happens is when you detonate the explosive within a bunker like that, it, it'll kill everything in the room. But since it's so hot that day, they change the venue to a room that has windows. 
So this is already, st it's starting not to work out. So, so as the explosive, you know, they crush the cap, they put it in, they put it in the satchel. And, and you know, what it is, is you have a wire holding back a, uh, a firing mechanism, a pin, and that thing shoots in there and hits a percussion cap, kind of like the old days, you know, and that's what sets off the explosive. Because you can play with plastic explosive like putty and never it go off. But as soon as you put an, uh, an electric charge or something explosive, it'll, it'll go off. So he puts it down and they, you know, the bomb's primed and he puts it underneath the table. And at this time, um, he's got another conspirator that we haven't talked about, uh, General um, Feldgebel. You see in the movie, he's the guy that's the head of communications. And he's the one that makes a phone call to tell Stauffenberg, hey, you need to take this phone call. And Stauffenberg leaves the room. And as he's leaving the room, a couple minutes later, it explodes. So, so how, yeah. How does he escape the world scenario? Because Stauffenberg intended to come out that he's alive, right? He, how does he escape? From, because there's, if I remember correctly, there is two checkpoints that he has well, to get he, through. He has to go through several checkpoints. And as soon as the explosion goes off, remember the SS and his bodyguards and the security apparatus surrounding Hitler go into action. These guys are like surgical precision. So what is theorized what happened is that he was able to, through... Um, somehow, I, I don't know if the movie gets this right, okay, somehow con his way past the guards, whether it's a fake phone call or, or what he does, but he somehow gets beyond there. I, it, it, I don't know if, I, I think it was a phone call, but I don't know if we will ever truly know what actually, how he got through there. Um, he- It's a miracle for sure. It's a miracle because, you know, nobody can get through. I think, I really think it has to do with General Eric Feldgable. I think somehow he relays a message and gets him past the guard post. You don't think you bribed sure. them? You don't think you bribed the guards with money or? No, I, I honest, I think, I think when you're talking about these, these SS men, these are the, the pinnacle of the, the shoot stoffel, you know? They are guys that are not gonna be easily bribed. These guys are fanatically loyal to Adolf Hitler and they would have done anything to stop anybody from leaving. So it, it's, it's really, like you said, it, it's, a, it's a miracle he got through there. But I think it has to do with Eric, uh, General Eric, Feld Gable, and he's the communications officer, and and um, he is and kind of just briefly on on Feld Gable, he's a real interesting guy. Hitler doesn't really trust him, but he's a brilliant person. He's the one that helped set up the Enigma sh machine. You know the secret codes the Germans mm. were able to send. Uh, he's the one that helped implement that. He's a brilliant person, but behind the scenes. He is working with the Red Orchestra. I think they called it Rote Capella. It's the Red Orchestra is the communist uh, uh, underground within Berlin because Feldgabel gives a lot of information to the Russians that kills a lot of Germans. He gives them a lot of stra strategy, what the Germans are doing. This isn't known at the time, but he is doing this. So he's, he's on board as a conspirator conspirator, not as a monarchist, but more as a communist with the Red Orchestra. So he's an interesting character. So, so, so when the bomb detonates, um, there's about, oh, I, I would say there's about 20 people in there and I think three or four are killed. I mean, it's, Nobody... it's important to mention that it's just on the other side of the table from where he threw his standing, right? Yes, that is very important. There's that, that's another factor. You're talking about probably a thick, huge, thick oak table, 
And once Stauffenberg leaves, supposedly one of the adjutants who actually gets killed moves the briefcase around the legs of the table away from Hitler. So you have two factors there. The explosion is, is, is dissipated through the windows, right? Mm. So that's, that's the survival. If it was in the concrete bunker, everybody would have died. So that's that's when it starts failing. The, when it when he moves the moves the uh, meeting from the concrete bunker, then he goes in into moving the briefcase, and then the miracle of von Stauffenberg leaving. The explosion happens about uh, 15 minutes to one. Stauffenberg gets in his aircraft. He leaves. He arrives in Berlin about four o'clock in the afternoon, and then. Then around that time, Feldgabel informs the plotters. Uh, he he calls the Bendler block. Remember, that's where they get shot, but that's where the operation kind of the the headquarters is of the operation. He phones them to say that that look, the explosion didn't kill Hitler, and you have no chance at all of of creating a coup. And so, but they go ahead with the plot, but nobody's doing anything. But has, this, has the explosion come out in the Republic radio yet, or is it in silence? No, it, it's, it's, it, nobody says anything yet, because Hitler is recovering. He's still wounded. I mean, I think probably blows his eardrums out. So he hasn't fully recovered. So he doesn't get on the radio yet. So, it's, so as soon as the explosion happens, Remember, there's three hours between the explosion, oh, maybe three and a half hours between the explosion and when Stauffenberg arrives back to Berlin. And Albrecht has not issued the orders of Valkyrie. He takes control, they arrest Fromm, but Albrecht, General Albrecht, he's, he's bungling the operation. And he doesn't issue the operation orders, Operation Valkyrie to be mobilized until four o'clock in the afternoon. Why? How did they convince him to launch Operation Valkyrie? What, say that again? How, how did they convince him to launch Operation Valkyrie? Because, but it, I'm going to use the movie as a reference again, because that's what the that and Shriver's produce for my knowledge of this. I'm going to be honest with you, but how did they see, in, at least in the movie, it seemed to be quite uh, back and forth in that he, is he's hesitant to launch? They're very hesitant. I think that's absolutely true. I think uh, Brian Singer gets it right. I think they're absolutely hesitant because they do not know if Hitler's dead. And and this and and really, you, you, you know, it's kind of like self-preservation. I think we would all do it. There is no word Hitler's dead, so Albrecht is in a position where he can't issue any of the orders. And it's not until Stauffenberg lands that he gets the call that, that Hitler's dead from von Stauffenberg, that he then, he then usurps General Fromm and, and initiates Valkyrie. But already by four o'clock, as soon as Stauffenberg lands, Keitel, Hitler, they all know Stauffenberg is missing and they want to know where he's at. And they all know that the uh, Bendler block is the epicenter of the plotters. So they're trying to get a hold of General Fromm to inform him, but he's been arrested. So, so Stauffenberg is actually trying to now keep the illusion that he still, that Hitler is dead because Keitel and everybody is now looking for him. So things are almost immediately collapsing. The whole operation is probably, well, first of all, they didn't kill Hitler. He miraculously escapes the wolf slayer. And I mean, to be fair, what are the chances that they are going to move the suitcase just minutes before it explodes? Well, I think, I think, two, I think there's two scenarios here. I think the, the, the two scenarios is von Stauffenberg put it, put it there in the wrong area out of nervousness, but, you know, Stauffenberg's an officer. The guy has, you know, he's, he's bold. He's a very, uh, uh, you know, self-contained officer. So I don't really see him actually 
doing that. I don't see him making it all the way to the wolf slayer and not thinking to put the satchel, the briefcase right next to Hitler. Mm -hmm. There's always that chance that he did. But I think the more reasonable assumption is it was in somebody's way. You know, when you're leaning over a table and your feet mm -hmm. are hitting a briefcase, that something happened where the briefcase was grabbed and put around. So I think, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, this is, it's, it's like, you know, one in a billion. It, uh, it's just another one. Miracle. One of the billion happened. Yeah, that it happened. Favor of, in favor of Hitler. Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, two things. Stop and put it in the wrong area, but I think more reasonably it was in the way. He didn't put it far enough under the table, probably. Hmm. And when you walk up to a table, you know, you look over a table, your feet are probably hitting it, and it was moved. And that's what happened. So, so what happens when they finally launch Operation Valkyrie, that the Marshall plan to, for the military takeover? What happens then? Well, they what, once they initiate Valkyrie, the home army goes into effect. And what they do is they put out a notice to the home army that the SS is trying to, to uh, that it's a coup of the SS trying to take over from Hitler. They don't know Hitler's dead or alive. They just know, well, they think it's a coup and they're supposed to suppress the coup and take over the SS headquarters. They're going to arrest, they're going to arrest uh, Goebbels. And, but it doesn't even get to that point. They initiate Valkyrie and it falls apart. It's oh, how long after is, how long does it take after they launch the operation? Um, it's between, you mean to, between the explosion and when- We have give the phone call that you are going to take a launch Operation Valkyrie now, and then oh. the home army goes in. You're talking within an hour. It, it mobilizes quickly. I mean, you're talking about guys that constantly are drilling for this, doing military drills. So it's within an hour it's mobilized. But within that hour that it's mobilized, it's falling apart. But you have, but you have, uh, it falls, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, by the time Stauffenberg gets there, Albrecht makes a phone call to do Valkyrie at four o'clock and by six o'clock, it's all almost completely dead. It's almost completely gone. I mean, it completely collapses on them because, because, um, because, because within this time of, of the hours it took for, if they, the key is here is that Valkyrie should have been initiated as soon as the explosion occurred. They lose a three-hour window. And with that three-hour window, Keitel and Himmler, they all know about it. And they're already now uh, starting to uh, uh, counterman the orders, right? So within, within, the two, within Albrecht initiating Valkyrie at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, Keitel and Himmler and everybody else is already countermandering all the orders of Valkyrie. So it's, it just collapses. So is, is the home army skeptical of at this at all? The question is, or is it no, no question at all? They just go through with this? Well, you know, under authoritarianism and, and you know, and, and with the German, the German is taught from the very beginning of their life to follow authority, right? from teachers to generals to politicians. So they're following the order to the T. They're not, I'm sure, I'm sure the commander, um, uh, I'm sure he had thoughts what's going on, but he gets an order from a general. He goes into action right away. But within a couple hours, he's getting notices that Hitler's not dead. Orders are being being told for him to stand down and the, and, and the plot dissolves very quickly. So he, he, so there are, you know, I'm sure there's skepticism there, but as a, a an ex-military person myself, I think if I was in this situation, I would have followed orders. 
somebody calls from the uh, Bendler Brock saying, hey, there's a coup, a general's telling me this, that's my job, I gotta, I gotta go into action. That's what I would have done unless I was told otherwise. And he's told otherwise. All these orders start to come through that to start ignoring Albrecht's orders, von Stauffenberg's orders, Beck's orders, everybody. It, it, it happens so quickly in the amount that we're actually talking here Imagine that within an hour or two, that is how the fast the plot collapses. So about the length of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, and so that's kind of, you know, so it tells you that it really was bungled from the time it exploded or the briefcase moved, right? The wrong building, the, you know how the planets align for you to make everything work out, right? You know, so to speak, mm -hmm. nothing works out here. And so you're talking, um, so now you're talking by uh, 1800 or six o'clock in the uh, early evening, there already nobody is listening to orders anymore. So what now, happens, yeah, come on. Oh no, so, so now you have, now you've got soldiers and the Waffen SS coming to the Benler block, the headquarters. Mm -hmm. Now we know what's going on. Now we know that somebody tried to have a coup and kill Hitler. So by seven o'clock, Hitler's fine. He start he starts making the phone calls. He starts calling the commanders. Starts calling, um, you know, Goebbels. Starts calling everybody so they could hear his voice. Is he pissed? Like he's a pissed on the phone? Like he's screaming? Like he's all he's always doing? <laughs> kind of like. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't happy. But also another thing to remember is that the Valkyrie was also going on in Paris. You know, they were arresting SS officers, their conspirators there. So this was a wider than just Berlin and Germany. It was all throughout the, the, the you know, the kind of the pan-Germanic empire here. And so, but by, I mean, by about eight o'clock, it's over. It's completely over. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the SS and the, the, the German army is already in, in the Bendler block. They, they free General Fromm from arrest. There's some fire exchange. Accordingly, Stauffenberg gets wounded and, and it's over. And, and now the conspirators are completely overwhelmed. So what happens to them then? Do, do they attempt to es escape or are, do they realize this is over? Are they trying to kill themselves or no, they, do they wait for to get attacked? Arrest, no, arrested. They, they were um, they were arrested. And the interesting thing is General Fromm is on the fringes of the conspiracy. He's not involved in it, but he kind of knows that something's going to go on. And he's an opportunist, an opportunist right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to blow with the wind here. But, but um, he decides he's in self-preservation mode. So he arrests Albrecht, Stauffenberg, Stauffenberg's aide-de-camp, Hefton, uh, a guy named, uh, uh, I believe his name was Kornheim, uh, Ludwig Beck. So these are the guys that you see in the movie that are arrested in the Bendler block and from immediately sentences them to death. Mm. And supposedly since Lud Ludwig Beck asked for a pistol to shoot himself and he's so nervous, he botches the job up and then um, he shoots himself. I guess it grazes off the forehead. He doesn't die. Another officer comes in and shoots him in the head. And then they take the other four or five conspirators out to the Benler block where it's now, I think it's called von Strassenberg, Stauffenberg Strasse, von Stauffenberg Street. And they take them into the courtyard and they summarily execute them. And it's completely over. But the orders were uh, to not kill these guys, right? Why would you want to mm -hmm. kill the conspirators? You would want to you would want to let your intelligence officers uh, interrogate them first, right? Mm -hmm. 
So Fromm is in this frenzy. He's got to like, oh, I got to shoot these guys because they might tell on me that I knew. And so, but by a little after midnight, uh, have you ever heard of uh, Otto Scorsini? Uh, you know, he's, no. he's kind of the, he's the guy that, uh, he was kind of a, a hero in the SS. He comes in and he orders Fromm to stop the executions. And so, so then you have like, uh, you have, um, then you have the, uh, within this conspiracy, um, you, you know, you have the arrest of like Girdler, you have the arrest of the Berlin police chief, you have the arrests of all these conspirators, and um, they are tried by, uh, a lot of them are tried by the notorious judge Roland Freisler. Uh, if you ever get on YouTube, look up, look him up and watch him. He always is screaming. He sentence every, he's, he's known for sentence everybody to death. Um, they go in front of this judge. He sentences them to death. Um, he's also notorious for beheading uh, the conspirators with the Vice Rosa, the White Rose, um, the uh, the young lady uh, that was the nonviolent. Uh, 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 she she uh, gosh I can't I can't believe I can't think of her name. But he ends up, they behead these people by guillotine. He's just the judge they go in front of later on and then they get executed. There's about six to 9,000 plotters and about 5,000 are executed. People like Girdler and the, the police chief, uh, they're hung. Uh, they say they hung them with piano wire, but I think it was actually thin hemp rope that they used. I'm not absolutely sure. But they, they just go through and they just start going all through uh, the rank and file uh, and going after all the conspirators. I mean, Girdler, the guy who was the mayor of Leipzig, who was going to become chancellor, he 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 tell you know he he tells on a lot of people, hundreds or not thousands of plotters get arrested because of him. But um, I guess you know the. Uh, Kind of the tail end of this thing is here is um, I don't I think that I think it was doomed from the beginning kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. starting with the bomb um, the the plotters you know I think I don't I, I honestly think that if Hitler would have been killed I don't know if the plot still would have succeeded because of the timeline. Because uh, you think anything would have changed at all if oper if Operation Valkyrie would have been successful? I I don't I don't think so. I I don't. You mean for the German people in mm, general? In, ge in general, yeah. No, I, I because um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. The, the Brits, British intelligence, tried to put a plan together to assassinate Hitler at his retreat in Berchtesgaden Garden in Bavaria. Mm. What's this operation? Uh, Volkstrot, I believe. Yeah, Torchy, yeah, Torch, yeah. And so that was, and then and then they're like, why kill the guy? He's doing such a great job, uh, you know, making such bad decisions with his military. We're gonna win faster if he's in, you know, it's still fewer than if he's out, because the war might have been prolonged longer. But this is but this is the key element here. We, we, we've got to really, I think, look at, um, you know, going back to the plot and just maybe, maybe just spend five minutes here talking about the, con the, the controversy. Of course. It, the controversy is that the film, I love, like I said, I love the film. I love Tom Cruise, Brian Singer. The film is great. But it starts at 1943, and we don't get the psychology, sociology of what is going on with these conspirators. Um, and, and, and this is just my historical opinions, and, other will, and others will debate this based on how they reconcile the facts, is that I don't necessarily think the conspirators were heroes. Because you got to kind of remove yourself from the Hollywood romanticism 
and kind of the German folklore about the conspiracy. Because the conspiracy, uh, as the saying goes, and I don't, I don't know if they say it in Norway, but as the saying goes, you know, the tail go, grows taller down the line through generations, right? Mm. You can make somebody a hero that not necessarily is a mm. hero. And I think assassinating Hitler. I mean, to be fair, I think it will be impossible to make Hitler a hero generations down the line. No, not 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 make Hitler a hero, but make the conspirators a hero. Mm. I think I think removing them. I think uh, it's 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 kind of a it seems kind of harsh, but in this short time, you know, the Germans uh, appeared to be you know a little bit desperate for a hero, and in the 1960s. The conspirators added legitimacy to a new new German armed forces, the Bundeswehr, right? Mm. Because in the 50s, the conspirators were still looked at as traitors. I don't think they're traitors, by the way. Okay, I think removing Hitler was a noble act, but it's the intentions of what the conspirators want. The conspirators are educated men, right? And when you read about Nietzsche, you begin to understand how kind of deep the human desire is for moral self-exculpation, right? Exculpate is a similar in the meaning to exonerate. I mean, wasn't Hitler's ideology based on Nietzsche itself? No, I no. His is more on, I think his is more on Darwin and the natural selection. That's not And it was his, definitely inspired by Nietzsche, if I remember. Oh, well, sure. Well, I think, well, when we look at Nietzsche writing about Untermenschen, mm. I think that Nietzsche's sister and brother kind of bring that into the fold of Nazism. Mm. I don't think that was Nietzsche's intention, which would be a great mm. another uh, conversation. I don't think that that, when it comes to the word Untermenschen, that that necessarily, uh, because Nietzsche's long dead before Hitler's rise. Mm. And, but and I, I, I feel like Nietzsche kind of inspired people in in the wrong way, like a, a well, lot of them, if you, if you, I would hesitate to call them that, let's say villains are inspired by Nietzsche. So I well, feel like he inspired right. in people in the wrong way that he well, was meant I, to. And I think you're right. And, and what I'm getting to is when, with Nietzsche, you know, the, when, you know, with the self exculpation, you know, it's similar to exonerate. And I think this is where the conspirators are thinking. When you exonerate someone, you clear a person of an accusation and a suspicion that goes along with it. And it plays right into the psychology of the conspirators. And I'll tell you why. Let's look at Treskow. I think Treskow, he's all, you can look it up online anywhere. He's always using Christianity and, you know, kind of, you know, morality and, and how things were unfolded. And he was disgusted with the the night of the long nights he's disgusted mm -hmm. with the nuremberg's laws but he but on the contrary he's part of the hay action in the ukraine mm -hmm. that kidnaps 50,000 polish and ukrainian children between the ages of 10 and 14 to use as forced labor which under the nuremberg laws under uh, under the nuremberg trials this is one of the definitions of genocide. And so, and, and also Treskow also, this is why I think it's more about self-preservation. These guys are monarchs. That, that he also enacts what's, he's, he's disgusted with what's called the, the commissar orders. And that was Hitler made an order that every Soviet commissar in the East should be shot and murdered immediately. He was disgusted with that. But then on the flip side of it, he he follows what's called the Nacht and Nabel decree. And this decree says that anybody conspiring against the Germans in foreign lands should disappear, should be shot, should be murdered. Um, and, and Treskow, he follows the Nacht and Nabel, he follows the Hay action. He, 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 he's doing all these things leading up to the conspiracy to kill Hitler. So I just don't know if using, you know, 50,000 children for slave labor within Germany's workforce 
is is the morality of of somebody that has other intentions when it came to Hitler. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. They're doing things. They're doing things. It's kind of hypocritical in a sense. It is very hypocritical. And I, again, like, I, I, it is a noble cause to kill Hitler. I mean, I don't fault them for that. But the intentions of these guys wasn't to, to just, just dissolve, you know, the Third Reich and give up. It wasn't their intentions at all. And, and even if you look at Ludwig Beck, I mean, he's, he's an important sympathizer of the Nazis in the early 30s. And he gives rise to, you know, and support to the, to the Nazis and serves them up until I think his conscience, I think he might be one of the more conscientious people here that he saw where this was going. And, he, you know, people make mistakes. We all do. And he looked back and he said, I made a big mistake. But he also is, you know, he also is a, a supporter. But I think, but I think here we have to look at, you know, the 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 person that really is the hero in all this, and that's Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg. Uh, and I just I look at him as as here's the thing is he, he's originally was an enthusiastic supporter of the Third Reich until they're losing the war in 1943. And I think he so he's was, hypocritical himself as well, in a sense. Sure, he's hypocritical because I also think, and I know this will probably cause a lot of people getting upset, but I think he's also a race supremacist. And I'll tell you why. He believed in Lebensraum. He believed in enslaving the Poles as agricultural workers, and he and believed that they were untermenschen. Mm. So, so kind of bring and, kind of bring serfdom back into the into the third Reich. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, use these people to as workers. I mean, the letters to his wife are evidence of the pathology of when he was in of his pathology in, in Poland. And I've never seen the actual letters. I've requested these, and I've never. I don't think they're they're out there, but I've never seen the actual letter. But like I said, the the, the narrative. Um, the, the, when Stauffenberg in 1935, excuse me, 1939, writes to his wife when he participated in the invasion of Poland, and he expresses his views on the Slavic people as untermenschens and slave laborers. And this is what he says. The population is an incredible rabble. There are many Jews and half-breeds. These people feel good when you control them with a whip. The thousands of prisoners will do our agricultural economy good. They are certainly be put to good use in German and, and will be industrious, willing, and easily satisfied. Stauffenberg is an aristocrat. And, and so he also, I think, believe, believed that all men weren't equal. I think he believed in the national socialist cause. He believed, certainly as an aristocrat, he believed in natural hierarchies, and he believed that they should be respected. I mean, his, his brother, who was also a conspirator, Berchtold, he approved of the Nazi racial policies. He was, he was a scholar and published articles in 1933 that defended, um, you know, taking out the Ost Judens, the Eastern Jews, of their German citizenship based on racial grounds. So this is where, and I would love to have a, a, you know, a discussion on this too. Of course. You know, may, maybe I'm wrong, but when I read this, when I read this letter to his wife, I see this as an air of race supremacy. And mm -hmm. as, you know, and I see it as, you know, the Slavic people are looked at as the lower subhumans. Yeah, which is bullshit, with, of course. Yeah, yeah, along with, along with, along with Jews. And so, <clears throat> I, I mean, who think, the hell are to be controlled by a whip? Yeah, well, exactly. But this is, but see, this is where, this is where it's like, I, you have to look at prior to when the, 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 the Brian Singer movie takes off, because these men believed in the colonization of Poland, not just reclaiming the territory they lost in the Versailles Treaty, 
but they believed in enslaving people. He was, I think Stauffenberg was appalled by the mass murder of Jews, mass murder of Jews. But that's where this hypocrisy, confusing gray area of being a hero comes in. I just don't see that how somebody could want to be disgusted on one end and slave a people on the other, or like Von Trescu, uh, kidnap and enslave 50,000 Polish and Ukrainian children and put them to work as slave laborers. I just don't see how the morality of the romanticism, the, the morality and the romanticism of this it's kind of ruined the romanticism. Yeah, it, it does because we have to look at what these guys' in, intentions were to do. They wanted to, they uh, some of the plotters, some of the intention was to make peace with the Allies, but continue the war against the the Slavs, the Russians in the east, and keep that territory. Yeah. And they and so and they believed. You know, and they also believed to keep the Pan-German Reich, which was, which was when you look at the so-called Aryan nations, according to the Nazis, when you look at, uh, you look at Denmark, right? You look at Belgium, you look at uh, Norway, you look at uh, the Netherlands, that was going to be what they thought would be the Pan-German Reich. That was it. Berlin would be renamed to Germania, and this was what was going to be their center of, of culture, of the harem folk. So, but we also, another thing, and I'll wrap it up here, I know I'm talking a lot, is, is some of the other conspirators, kind of the ones not necessarily on the fringe, but maybe closer to the inner circle, were, um, were people like Heldorf, who was the police chief in Berlin, he was a conspirator and he was integral in the conspiracy, even though it fell apart. He was integral, so intricate into the conspiracy because he was the Berlin police chief. And he told the conspirators like von Stauffenberg and Beck and all them that he would not interfere with his police force in the coup. But did, did Heldorf do it on moral reasons? No, I think he was a notorious anti-Semite. He, he was instrumental in kicking Jews out of their homes. Again, you may, he was an opportunist as well, you think? Uh, as an opportunist, stealing stuff. He stole from Jews. He kicked them out of their houses. Um, he was instrumental in helping the Nazis. He was also you know, notorious for his gambling debts. And he, and he did this to very wealthy Jews stole from them. And, and another person that I think we should focus on that, that you know, we, all want, we want to focus on just a few people, but we want to go outside and we want to look at somebody called Arthur Neve, or Neve. And he is one of the conspirator, conspirators. He's not a central conspirator, but he's on the out, outside of them. And this man was an SS officer that led Einsatz Group and B on the Eastern Front. And for all the people that don't know what the Einsatz Group and B was, they were the action groups that followed the regular army, like Treskow led, like uh, Stauffenberg led. They came behind and they mass murdered Slavs and Jews. And these, and they were notorious. The Einsatz Group and B that Arthur Neville was a part of killed 40,000 Jews between July of 1941 and November of 1941. He was, the, if you ever get a chance, just look up the Einsatz Group. And these are just, they're mass murders. They're the ones that, they began the Holocaust with bullets. They, they killed millions of people. Um, and they, they were the ones that were instrumental in conducting the Babi Yar massacre in the Ukraine outside of Kiev where they lined up 40,000 Jews, Ukrainian Jews, and they dug these trenches and they shot them and then buried them in the trenches. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going there next month um, to it, but this was the Einsatz group. And so these are some of the part of the people that were part of the conspirators. 
and the thing is, is that if Germany would, would have never been able to surrender unconditionally, these type of conspirators would have been tried for war crimes. They would have not been saved by the plot. It, there is a chance that Treskow would have been tried as a war criminal for his actions under the, the Nocturne Naval Decree uh, and under the, uh, the kidnapping of the children. He certainly would have been wanted to be, the Soviets would have certainly wanted to try him and the Poles. And Heldorf, the police chief, Beck probably would have escaped from it. But I you think, think Stauffenberg that, would have would have driven away with it, or do you think he? I think Stauffenberg. Look, I think Stauffenberg. Uh, he wasn't a mass murderer. He didn't mass murder people. I think uh, you know he had him and Treskow. Treskow, you know, I think he was in a position. Position as a general, but I think von Stauffenberg would have never been tried for anything. He was an army officer. He, you know, served his country. He, there's a chance. I don't know. I don't think he was anti-Semitic, but he was certainly had some ideology of race supremacy when it came to, came to the Slavic peace bill on the Ost front, the East front. I don't think he would have been sent through the 12. There was 12 Nuremberg trials. I don't think he would have been a participant in that. I think he would have probably lived out a very healthy life. But I think people like Heldorf, uh, Neva, the Ansatzgruppen commander, I think Treskow, I think those types of people within the conspiracy would have been tried for war crimes. I think they might not have been tried in Nuremberg, but they might have been tried in like Warsaw or other places, maybe Kiev. But uh, Neb, who was the head of the Einsatz Group in B, I think you should call him Neb or Neb, but in Einsatz Group in B, he would have certainly been tried for war crimes. All the Einsatz Group in were tried. People like Otto Ohlendorf, all of them. Uh, they, but he ended up being, I think, hung or shot prior to the capitulation of Germany in 1945. He was shot by the Germans for his role in the conspiracy. Uh, Girdler, who was, uh, you know, I think we already talked about him, but he, he would have been the chancellor. But he's another interesting character because I think- I, I, he, actually, he I, think, we, I think we talk, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up right now because at, at the time of this recording, it's where I live, it's 1.30 a.m. So I think we're gonna have to wrap it up right now. But thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Do you before you go, do you have anything you wish to promote? Anything you, uh, any social uh, media where people can find you, or if you? Um, no, I just um, I do a lot of uh, historical work for uh, museums and things like that, and I'm writing a book on the sociology of the Third Reich. But I don't really have anything to promote. I just uh, enjoy talking uh, history of the Third Reich. Thank you so much for coming, and next time we will continue opera our operation for on this podcast with Operation Paper Queen. Thank you for so much for coming. You can find us on Instagram under redh 12 Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. And uh, if you like this episode, check out some of the other episodes we got as well, and we got some really good episodes coming up. So make sure you stay tuned. Thank you for coming. And my name is Alan. This has been Wadat H12, and I'll see you next time.